This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Fidget spinners, funny hats, the earth. Everyone loves stuff that spins, so that's what we'll be looking at in this video. Specifically, gyroscopes, or rather, control moment gyroscopes, or CMGs. These are devices used to generate stabilizing torque in anything from fancy boats to satellites. Today, I'll be using a pair of them to stabilize a miniature monorail train. But why a monorail? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's over 160,000 miles of railroad track in the United States alone, costing at least $2 million per mile to lay. At an absolute bare minimum, that's $320 billion worth of railroad infrastructure. So if you cut that in half by using one rail instead of two, you could save $160 billion, which you could then turn around and spend on building this thing. Or maybe fund another war in the Middle East. Nice. So did I just solve a major problem with the national transportation infrastructure in the United States? No, I'm just making YouTube content. Now, if you're mechanically inclined, you'll probably recognize very quickly that stabilizing a two-wheeled vehicle is a great application for a reaction wheel. So how is a CMG different? Well, they both generate stabilizing torque and involve the use of spinning wheels with lots of angular momentum, but they do it in very different ways. A reaction wheel is pretty straightforward and probably easier to understand. When you apply a torque to something, a torque of equal magnitude in opposite direction will be applied to you. Just think of a helicopter without a tail rotor, for instance. Hence, if you have something like a bike that you want to keep upright with a reaction wheel, as you start to tilt clockwise, applying a counterclockwise torque to the reaction wheel will counteract the tilting moment and bring you back upright. Now the catch here is that the wheel needs to be accelerating for there to be any torque. Simply running the reaction wheel at a constant speed won't cause any torque. So if you apply a torque to the wheel for too long and reach the maximum RPM of the motor, you've reached a condition known as saturation, where you can't apply any more torque. So if you're just reacting to small disturbances, like keeping a bike within a few degrees of being upright, the reaction wheel can maintain stability, but if the disturbance has become too large, the wheel will get saturated trying to counteract them. There's also the problem that for an electric motor, torque tends to go down as RPM goes up. So as you get closer to saturating the reaction wheel at max RPM, the reaction wheel is becoming less and less effective because motor torque is going down. So ideally, to stay far away from saturation, you'd want a reaction wheel with a tremendous amount of inertia and a motor with a tremendous amount of torque and a very high maximum RPM, but this is where we have to start making trade-offs. For a given motor power, maximum RPM is going to go down as maximum torque is increased, and increasing the inertia of the reaction wheel means either increasing the weight or the diameter, which pretty quickly becomes a limiting factor, especially if the wheel is mounted on something where weight is super important, like, you know, a satellite. As far as the control system is concerned though, a reaction wheel stabilizer is pretty easy to set up. It can be as simple as taking an angular error and then feeding that directly to the PWM duty cycle of a motor driving the reaction wheel to compensate. A control moment gyro, or CMG, is a little less intuitive in the way it works. Typically, you don't have a very large or heavy wheel, but it has a lot of angular momentum from spinning really, really fast. So when you've got a fast spinning object like this and you apply a torque to the rotation axis, it causes another torque 90 degrees away from both the rotation axis and the axis that you're applying the torque on. So let's say this disc has an angular momentum vector called L, which looks like this. It's spinning counterclockwise around the positive axis of the vector. So that's why the arrow is pointed that way. The magnitude of L is the angular speed of the disc times its moment of inertia, which are both things we can figure out really easily. In this example, our disc is laying flat and spinning counterclockwise, so the vector would be pointed up along the positive z-axis. If it was spinning clockwise, the vector would be pointing down. Now let's say this whole thing is mounted on some sort of bracket, and I try to tilt it counterclockwise around the positive x-axis by applying some torque to that bracket. This torque vector would look like an arrow going along the positive x-axis. What will end up happening is that it actually creates a torque counterclockwise around the positive y-axis of the same magnitude as the torque that I applied to the bracket, at least in theory. Alternatively, you can figure out the torque around the y-axis by just multiplying the angular momentum of the wheel by the angular rate of change of the L-vector around the x-axis, in other words, how fast it's tilting. This can be useful because if you didn't know how much torque you were applying, but you did know the rate of tilt, you could still use that information to calculate the gyroscopic torque that's being generated. Anyway, this whole gyroscopic torque thing is how my gyroscope walker from a couple years ago worked. Tilting to the left, for example, would cause a torque that tilted it forward, which would in turn cause a torque that tilted it to the right, and so forth, which would ultimately lead to a wobbling around the rotation axis known as precession. 
but this allowed it to stand upright. The downside was that without being secured on a rail or cable, it would tend to just spin itself against its own flywheel inertia and go nowhere. So you might be tempted to think the solution is just to add another wheel and make it like a bike, but now you've removed its ability to tilt forward or backward, so it can't maintain stability by processing. In this case, a fixed gyro isn't going to work anymore. However, you could maintain stability by actively tilting the wheel so that as the vehicle tilted left or right, the wheel could tilt forward or backward to compensate, making it a control moment gyro. And yeah, this would work with just one gyro. The problem is, as soon as you hit a hill, the vehicle would tilt to one side from the sudden change in pitch, and this could lead to a crash. In fact, this is a known issue with some airplanes. Pitching up very suddenly can lead to a very hard yaw to one side. Now admittedly, part of this effect is aerodynamic, but there's also a substantial gyroscopic torque from the propeller's axis of rotation tilting up so quickly, enough to be very dangerous in some cases. In aviation, this is called P-factor. If you really don't know what you're doing and you don't react fast enough, in some cases you might end up rolling inverted as soon as you take off. So yeah, we want to get rid of those unwanted gyroscopic effects, so the trick is to use two counter-rotating gyros. If they've got the same mass and rotational speed, but opposite rotation directions, the torques cancel each other out. To create a torque, you simply tilt them opposite to one another. I 3D printed this 3 inch diameter ABS flywheel to see if a 3D printed gyro would have enough angular momentum to work as a CMG. It weighs 58 grams, and then when I convert the diameter to metric and do a little math, the moment of inertia comes out to this. So let's say it's spun up to around 6,000 RPM, for example. That gives us an angular momentum of 0 0.026 kilogram meter squared per second. I think I got those units right. Say you tilt that at, for example, 60 degrees per second. That comes out to 0 0.027 newton meters of torque. Hmm. Doesn't sound like much, but then again, it's going to be a pretty small model, and there's going to be two gyros, so that would actually make it 0 0.054 newton meters. It seems like it might work. I used a 2mm shaft flange adapter to connect the flywheel to a tiny 3 volt motor and spun it up as it was dangling on a piece of string. You can clearly see how the gyroscopic torque causes it to spin around the string as gravity is attempting to pivot the axis of rotation downward. Here's a slightly cleaner demonstration on an actual gimbal mount. You may notice that as the axis of rotation is moved more toward the vertical, the precession speed is reduced and that's because the torque acting on the gyro is smaller now. All this talk of spinning makes me dizzy, but you know what else makes me dizzy? Unprofessional looking websites. Do you really want to join a cult if their website looks like this? I wouldn't even want to buy post-it notes from a site that looked that bad. If you're doing any sort of business, you're going to need a good looking website and a service to host it, and Squarespace can do both. Whether you're a recruiter for a doomsday cult, a small business owner trying to sell stuff or advertise your services, or an artist trying to show off your portfolio, Squarespace is the perfect tool. Squarespace provides all the tools you need to build and host a website for your business. Graphic design, media integration, payment processing, inventory management, appointment scheduling, traffic analytics, and even the ability to run ads on social media for your business. Squarespace has it all in one easy-to-use system that doesn't require any programming knowledge. I mean, seriously, why bother learning more programming languages when all that stuff is going to be done by this guy in five years? Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and if you want to launch a website, go to squarespace.com slash hyperspacepirate to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. So there's an issue with control moment gyros, which can get into a condition that has the same effect as saturation for a reaction wheel, and this condition is called gimbal lock. Let's look at our vector diagram again. When our flywheel is laying flat, its axis of rotation is nice and perfectly perpendicular to the roll axis of the vehicle, which is what we're interested in controlling, so any pitch deflection of the rotation axis at this point will cause 100% of that torque to end up being applied to the roll axis. But now suppose the flywheel has been tilted 45 degrees. The vector of the torque driving the gimbal is still the same, but the resulting gyroscopic torque vector points both forward and down, so now we've got roll and yaw torque. Now the yaw component of the torque shouldn't be a big deal, because this is a two-wheeled vehicle, so either tire friction, or in my case, the rail interference should block it from spinning horizontally. The bigger issue is that the magnitude of the roll torque has decreased, because it's proportional to the cosine of the angle between the rotation axis and the vertical, or positive z-axis. What this means is that as the gyro is tilted more and more, it becomes less and less effective until the axis of rotation is aligned with the axis we're trying to control, which is the roll axis in this case. At this point, we've reached gimbal lock, which is effectively the same problem as saturating a reaction wheel. So just as in the case with a reaction wheel, on a control moment gyro, we'd like a flywheel with as much inertia as humanly possible to be able to generate plenty of torque while staying far, far away from gimbal lock. 
However, unlike with a reaction wheel, with a CMG, we have an additional parameter we can use to increase angular momentum and stay away from gimbal lock, which is the speed of rotation. CMGs have a relatively small flywheel, but when they're spun up to tens of thousands of RPM, the amount of angular momentum stored in them allows a much wider control bandwidth before reaching gimbal lock. Of course, this comes with the drawback that when the vehicle is first started up, you might have to wait some time before the gyros spin up, which is a problem reaction wheels don't have. Another downside is that you have to balance these flywheels extremely well to avoid vibration since they're spinning so fast, and this is a problem that reaction wheels don't really have so much since they're usually moving Moving pretty slow. I'm not going to be spinning that fast, so I figured I'd bump up the inertia of my flywheels by getting these solid steel discs instead of the 3D printed ones. The dimensions are the same as the printed discs, but the density is approximately 7.8 times higher, which will give me a lot more to work with and require much less angular change to produce a stabilizing torque. In order to make sure they're as balanced as possible, I printed this hole locator jig that the steel discs fit tightly into. Then I drilled some shallow pilot holes which I can finish off on the drill press and these will be used for bolting on the shaft flange adapter. Although even with a healthy amount of cutting oil, I still managed to break off drill bits in both of the discs, and with no way to get them out, I just ended up using only two bolts for the flange adapters instead of the full four. It's definitely not optimal, but as long as it's balanced, that's the most important thing. And the motor shaft fits perfectly, so I'm ready to take these gyros and build them up into an actual assembly. So here's what I modeled up in SolidWorks. It's basically a cradle for a pair of gyro gimbals with servos to drive them on both ends and little wheels on the bottom to make it move along the track. There's also a battery bay and a little platform where a board and some other electronics will be mounted. A 3 volt brushed motor is popped into a little depression in the gimbal and has a retainer cover screwed on over it to keep it from popping out. Then the steel disc is mounted and it seems to spin pretty smoothly. Here's the identical pair of those gyros. This part is going to be the main body of the train, which is just the square frame, and then I'm going to add these brackets on the bottom, which are meant to mount the wheels. A small platform is attached to the front to mount some of the electronics on, and a battery tray is attached to the back. I would have printed this all in one piece, but my 3D printer was just a bit too small. The 5 volt buck converter is screwed on right in front of the battery, which reminds me, I need to explain how the electronics are set up on this thing. A 2 cell lithium battery, so about 8 volts, provides power to the gyro motors and the propulsion motor. It also goes through a DC to DC buck converter and provides 5 volts DC to power an Arduino, MPU 6050 accelerometer, and servos used for tilting the gyros. These are the same kind of servos you'd use on an RC plane or car. The servos get their 5 volt power from the buck converter, but the PWM signal for positioning them comes from the Arduino. Now, in testing I found that with the motors connected directly to the 8 volt battery, they were spinning way too fast and producing crazy amounts of vibration despite my best attempts to balance the flywheels, so I wired them in series to effectively half the voltage across them so they didn't spin so fast. Anyway, here's the servos being installed on the frame. Each gimbal has two servos for extra torque, but also to make sure they're being driven symmetrically. Here's the MPU 6050, which will be sensing the tilt angle of the monorail. And here's my breadboard adapter that connects the Arduino to the servos MPU 6050 and power. Next, I install the swiveling wheels on the bottom of the monorail. Seems like they spin pretty freely. Then I put in these keyed shafts that will attach the gyro brackets to the servos in order to make them tilt. Seems to tilt pretty freely. Here's a shot of the assembly thus far. Here's a look at how the gyros respond to tilting on the roll axis without any restraint from the servos. One tilts a little less than the other because it has a little more friction, so I guess there's some sanding I have to do to make that one fit a little bit looser. And this is the complete assembly ready to go. I wrote a basic program on the Arduino just to test the range of motion of the servos and make sure they weren't fighting each other or binding or anything weird like that. Then I remembered I actually need a way to move this thing forward and all I put on it were freewheeling casters. So I printed a housing for one of those really tiny DC gear motors and secured it in with a little retainer plate glued to the back of the housing. This is the drive wheel which you can see has ridges for extra grip which the track will also have. The shaft opening was just a hair too small though, so I heated the motor shaft for a few seconds and got it just hot enough to melt the drive wheel on, and there's the full assembly. Let's see what sort of roll torque it produces with the gyros actually spinning. I was impressed to find that the CMGs actually have enough torque to pick up the entire vehicle off the ground when it's laying on its side and swing it all the way over to the other side. That means it should have plenty of torque to hold itself upright on the monorail track. But when I tried to test it, it went completely nuts and just jittered all over the place. It pretty much did this regardless of what gains I plugged into my PID loop, so maybe there was another issue here. It may be that the steel discs actually offer too much angular momentum and therefore take a very minuscule tilt rate in order to produce a relatively large torque, 
The problem with that is I can only move my RC servos in one degree increments, meaning I might not have enough granularity in my own control system to achieve stability. So I actually reverted back to using 3D printed wheels, which would reduce my control bandwidth but increase the granularity, but it had the same issue and looked like it was just having a seizure once the gyros were spun up. I think part of the problem was the way I was doing my control loop. The way it's set up, I have the MPU 6050 reading the tilt angle of the vehicle and then commanding the gyros to a new position accordingly. Since the torque comes from the tilt rate of the gyros rather than the tilt position, I think I need to change the control loop so that rather than moving to a clockwise or counterclockwise position, it will change the position at an increasingly faster or slower rate. Also, I call it a PID loop, but it's really a P loop because I've just got a proportional channel providing feedback based on the vehicle angular position. Since the MPU 6050 also has angular rate gyro sensors inside of it, I should probably use that to provide a D or derivative term, which would make this a PD controller. I think the basic 3D printed discs might not carry quite enough angular momentum, so I made some beefier ones that should have around double the moment of inertia. I also strapped a piece of rebar across the top of the train to see if that would slow down the jitter. What this does is it dramatically increases the vehicle's moment of inertia along the roll and yaw axes, which should lead to slower angular accelerations and give the control system more time to respond, making it a little more forgiving. This is the same reason people walking tight ropes carry those really wide stick things. In a best case, I could maintain stability for a couple seconds with this change, but it still seemed like the gyros weren't able to save it once it tilted 5 or 10 degrees. One problem with the big piece of rebar is how much weight it adds above the top of the vehicle, therefore increasing the destabilizing torque from gravity. To fix this, I printed these lightweight booms that would carry some half-inch bolts out away from the vehicle. Two of these would provide approximately the same moment of inertia contribution as the piece of rebar, but with way less weight added. After that change, and a couple hours of fiddling with the gains and tweaking my code, I finally got something that seemed stable. So then I took the profile I used for the section of straight track I tested on, and turned it into a big loop with a 24 inch diameter. The track has the same ridges on it as the drive wheel in order to have some grip. And there you have it, a miniature version of the gyro monorail from 1903. It'd be nice if I could get rid of these silly looking stabilizer booms, but I guess it's okay for a first prototype. So what did we learn? Well, if you've got to stabilize the angle of something, using a reaction wheel is probably going to be a hell of a lot easier than trying to use a control moment gyro. Also, RC servos are a terrible drive option for tilting the gyros because they're position based and have a relatively low resolution and control accuracy. If I make a second version of this, I'd probably directly couple my CMGs to a motor with a lot of torque, like a large diameter brushless outrunner, then simply apply PWM to modulate the torque. This is how camera gimbals work, so it probably makes sense for a control gyro too. But if you have the option, definitely use a reaction wheel instead. If I can refine this project a little more, I'm going to build a self-balancing RC bike with an oversized circus bear riding it. I've always dreamed of owning a performing bear, but it's illegal to own them in the state of Florida. So I guess a giant teddy bear on an RC bike will have to do. Uh, uh, okay, this is the end of the video. You can leave. Bye.